Okay, so last time uh, we went really long with a lot of good discussion on the microarrays. So I'm going to try and keep the lecture shorter today. Uh, although if we want, you know, if you have questions, we want to have a discussion uh, about the next gen sequencing, it's a good time to do that. And then after I finish the lecture, I'm going to walk you through a little brief introduction to the R software environment and then step by step through the first half of the homework assignment so you can see what it looks like and you know we can do a little back and forth discussion of that so that's what I hope to do today so I'm introducing next gen sequencing technology and but the homework is going to be on microarrays from uh, last week and we'll try and figure out how to get you access to enough computing power to do some exploration of some next-gen data. It's a bit of a challenge for us. It doesn't work well on a laptop. Okay, so what I want to cover today is mostly about Illumina sequencing technology, although I will very briefly discuss 454 kind of for historical reasons. I'm going to spend a little time talking about how they compute quality scores. Um, my favorite obsession on data formats for next-gen data. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the subtleties of setting up experiments, things like barcodes, multiplexing, um, paired end sequencing. Uh, we'll talk briefly about read alignment because that's a whole lecture. Um, data storage as a sort of global issue both for individual scientists and for the whole worldwide community and briefly touch on some of the applications and I'm going to have a couple more lectures to go into more detail on those things. So the main point of all of this is that DNA sequencing has gotten cheaper and faster and produce more data very very quickly. And I'll come back to this sort of slide over and over again. But when something gets so much cheaper, so much faster, it becomes a qualitative rather than a quantitative difference. You know, you can start switching other technologies over to a sequencing approach because sequencing is now thousands or tens of thousands of times cheaper than it was a few years ago. And while it may have slowed down a bit, there's no reason to think that we've hit the, the plateau point for sequencing technology. It's continuing to double every year. And Illumina, the major vendor, has plans to keep on increasing their data production. And many other companies are attempting to chase them down in one way or another. Um, as a result, publications making use of or emphasizing applications or just straight up data analysis algorithms for next gen technology are the biggest growth in PubMed. The, the, I mean, across all sciences, really, it's not just in biology, but very, very strongly dominating publications in biology are experimental approaches that make use of sequencing data. You know, microarrays have plateaued, other things, qPCR, you know, our, our steady state, southern and northerns have already started to drop off. <laughs> but new sequencing technologies is really where it's at. And we'll come back to that again and again as well. As more people use it, more data is generated, more people shift their research emphasis to informatics methods to deal with problems that are created or new technology variants that require informatic solutions. So where did this start? We go back to 1975 when Sanger invented a method for determining the sequence of bases in a piece of DNA. Um, this was done using DNA polymerase, which copies the DNA. It's a processive enzyme, meaning it adds one base at a time to a single stranded DNA molecule. It adds a base of complementary sequence. And Sanger's method was very elegant, and he deduced that a dideoxy nucleotide would not be able to 
extend the chain. So when you add a dideoxy to their sequencing reaction, it stops. And therefore, if you add a radio labeled dideoxy nucleotide, it stops. It makes a fragment of a discrete size that you could visualize on an electrophoretic gel. If you carefully titrate the amount of dideoxys plus normal deoxynucleotides in a mixture, you'll get a range of different stop points. So you set up a reaction that has some dideoxy A and some normal A plus the other three nucleotides plus the polymerase plus a template and you'll get a ladder of fragments that stop wherever an A shows up in the sequence. You repeat that for three other reactions with the other three bases as dideoxys and you get a set of four ladders that stair step through the sequence. It has to stop at one of those four in every position, a G, A, T, or a C. You run an electrophoresis on a big gel, you um, put a film, an x-ray film on it, the uh, radio label exposes the film, you read the film, and you write down by hand which of the four bases exists at each step in the gel, each position. It's not perfectly linear because the fragments separate more distantly at the bottom and smaller at the top. And so people play with the electrophoresis conditions, the salt buffers, etc. And after a few decades of optimization, people were able to get six to 800 bases at a shot in this way. Six to 800 bases from <clears throat> one cloned piece of DNA. And then you clone another piece and you run four more lanes and that's how I did my PhD thesis. So there you go. Next major step in the evolution of sequencing technology was developed by a company called Applied Biosystems using technologies mostly pioneered by Leroy Hood. And there's two innovations here. One is that instead of using a radioactive label on the dideoxynucleotides, they use a fluorescent label doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but there's different colors of fluorescence, different wavelengths, and so you could do um, the four separate bases in four separate reactions, but after the reaction is done, um, you could mix them together and run them in a single electrophoresis lane rather than four. It becomes easier to see which base is on top of which one, and because they're fluorescent, they can be read out automatically by a fluorescent detector. So the electrophoresis passes by a detector. There's a laser which excites the fluorescence in each of the four colors. The detector detects the fluorescence and figures out which color is brightest for that band. And the bands are relatively equally spaced. And so the detector has a reasonably easy time of reading out the sequence in an automated fashion. So you don't have to spend your afternoon looking at x-ray gels and writing down the bases by hand. So these two innovations together, fluorescent automated detection, um, increase the throughput in DNA sequencing by, you know, from 100 to 1,000 fold. So, you know, one graduate student can now, with a DNA sequencing machine, produce 10,000 to 100,000 bases of sequence data a week rather than the previous 1 to 2,000. Big difference. And this is how the Human Genome Sequencing Project was completed in around year 2000. At that time, the best way to get more DNA sequencing data was to install more DNA sequencing machines in really big warehouse-like labs. Um, the machines got a little more automated so that one technician could sort of go down the row loading reactions into the tops of those machines and then they would run all day producing data. Also, they had pipetting robots, but they still were cloning and sequencing each DNA fragment one at a time. Four separate reactions for that fragment with each of the four colors, mix them together, load them into a lane of the sequencer. 
one small innovation that came out at the very end of the Human Genome Project, so like between 2000 and 2001, was they moved the electrophoresis from a giant slab into a capillary tube loaded with um, polyacrylamide gel. The tubes allowed them to run the sequencing hotter, meaning higher currents, so the nucleotide, the, the fragments moved faster, so they could collect more data in a day. And a uh, machine previously was limited to a certain width, you know, just in terms of practicality, but with the, with the filaments, they could put more and more fibers in one machine. It still required all those reactions and someone still had to load all the wells. So there was some practical limit on how many um, sequences you could get out of one machine in one day, but that boosted the throughput by like another fourfold. Okay, so now we're going to talk about next generation sequencing, which was truly a conceptual break from this linear path that we'd been following all along. And it boosted the amount of sequence data by more than a thousandfold in one step. Um, and it started us on this path of ever increasing data throughput. Um, importantly, the, the level of increase is way faster than the speed that computer processors increase. Um, sequencing data is doubling in something like sequencing data production is doubling in something like every five months over the past six years, whereas over the past 40 years, computer chips have doubled in processing power every two years. So every year you have to buy at least twice as many CPUs to process the data that your sequencing machine produces. Same goes for hard drives. So the cost of computing is going up while the cost of sequencing comes down. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about 454 because they were the first to develop this concept, although there were some flaws in their system which have left them less competitive in today's landscape. So the original concept was not to sequence just one cloned fragment at a time, but rather take an entire genome or some other complex mixture of DNA fragments, chop them up to a relatively uniform size, attach some sort of primer or linker to the ends of all the fragments, then dilute them and sequence them in parallel all at once. The 454 technology used something they called emulsion PCR, where the, the, the individual DNA fragments, after they'd been chopped up and had primers attached to them, were diluted down and then vortexed very vigorously for a really long time in a mix of oil and water, such that you got these little um, reverse droplets of water in oil. So it's kind of like a reverse emulsion. And the aqueous drops, naturally DNA is water soluble, so the DNA goes into the aqueous, as well as all the buffer, the salts, the nucleotides, etc. And so you dilute the thing down, and this was a finicky step, so that you got approximately one DNA fragment in each droplet, one or zero. If you had more than one DNA fragment in each droplet, then you would get a mixed readout of the sequencing, and that would be messy and not usable. Um, once you had the dilution, oh, and another thing they threw into the mix were these um, little beads. And again, you wanted to get one bead in each um, droplet as well. Um, the beads contained a complementary sequence to the adapters that you ligated onto the end of your fragment. So what would happen is that the, a single piece of DNA would covalently attach to the bead, matching the adapter on the end that you've ligated on to the adapters that were synthesized onto the beads. Um, then they did something called emulsion PCR, where they made lots of copies of this original DNA fragment, 
all over the surface of the bead. So they're all clones, they're all identical. This is strictly a signal amplification step. Then they had this clever system where they dropped the beads into tiny, tiny little wells on a plate. They, they had the wells were drilled into the plate more or less and, they, and there was about a million wells in one plate. So you could collect about a million different sequences all at once. The nice thing about the plate with the wells is that the wells had very fixed positions. You knew exactly where each one was when you loaded the plate into the reader. So you could in fact sequence and collect the fluorescent data from each well simultaneously just by running the detector over the surface of the well or taking a sort of a pseudo photographic fluorescent image of all the wells at once. The, their locations were clear. Their sequencing technology left a little to be desired. What they, they, they adapted a technology that had been used by another company and what they did was they flowed a single base over all the wells at one time and that base would add as many A's, for example, as were available after following the previous base. In other words, so they'd add a bunch of A's, in other words. And if there was only one A, it would add one A and produce a fluorescent level of one. If there were two A's in a row on a particular clone fragment, it would add two and produce a fluorescent intensity twice as strong. The problem was that the software wasn't good at telling the difference between a fluorescence of say seven versus eight. So they had what they call homopolymer errors. So whenever there was a, a stretch of bases that were identical, it was very hard to tell exactly how many you had. This is hugely problematic when you're looking at coding sequences because a single base addition or deletion brings you out of frame, it's a frame shift. And just the fact that it was hard to resolve these things, and even if you had several different sequences of the same region, it was hard to figure out which was the right one. It's, it's, it's relatively hard to get a consensus of different lengths because they don't, the lengths don't really accurately reflect any sort of quality score. Um, the in another interesting thing about 454 technology is that since the number of homopolymer stretches in each different fragment in each different well was different. The same number of cycles of GATC wash, GATC wash, would give you different lengths of sequences for each cloned fragment. And also for various reasons, their reagents would sometimes peter out. And so you would get very short reads on some of the wells. So a data file from a 454 sequencer had sequences of all different lengths and had a certain level of uncertainty about all the homopolymer stretches. Nevertheless, they were producing millions of sequences in one shot as opposed to one sequence at a time from the traditional method. And so the savings wasn't just in the actual running of the sequencing machine, but a tremendous amount of savings of scientist time preparing individual clones, running individual reactions, and loading lanes of sequencing machines. If you could do the whole genome in one shot in a couple of days, it was worth the fact that the data was of somewhat lower quality. And so, and many different applications were built on top of this platform. Pyrosequencing is the chemistry of, of flowing those nucleotides across. It was a, another company that had this technology developed for a different purpose, which 454 licensed from them. And pyrosequencing had this same uh, homopolymer problem, but they were using it to sequence um, very short stretches. They were like doing primer extension reactions to do see if you had a you know single nucleotide variants you know so for example known mutations say a sickle cell mutation right you could do a pyrosequencing reaction and get 50 bases extended from a primer in a known sequence and for each sample you could know if there was a c or an a it had this 
problem, but it was the only available chemistry at the time that 454 was ready to go, and they were so excited about their concept of massively parallel sequencing that they didn't want to spend another five to ten years in R&D trying to invent a completely new sequencing technology, which is what Illumina did. Illumina took, well actually, uh, Selexa was the company, another private R&D company, took the fundamental concept of 454, which was massively parallel sequencing, break up a genome into small pieces, ligate primers onto all those small pieces, and sequence them all simultaneously. But they developed a completely new and different chemistry to do the sequencing. Um, similar to the 454, they needed a signal amplification step. The same fluorescent detectors are just not sensitive enough to detect one fluorescent event coming off of one DNA molecule. But instead of the messy um, emulsion PCR, what they decided to do was just use a solid surface. So in this case, sort of similar to a microarray, just a, a slide. They call it a flow cell now. Um, the solid surface is coated with these oligos that are complementary to the adapters that you ligate on to the ends of your genomic fragments. And again, you dilute down your original library, your, your set of DNA fragments with the adapters, so that when you wash it over the surface, the different fragments attach sufficiently far away from each other so that the, the signals don't overlap. And how far is sufficiently far changes with each iteration of the software and the hardware and the fluidics of the machine. So we'll just say sufficiently far. The next step is a, is a PCR, again, similar to the emulsion PCR, although these guys call it cluster generation. So interestingly, what they do is they cause the clone DNA molecules to bend over and attach to the solid surface at two different positions. There's a, basically an A end and a B end adapter that are ligated on to each fragment shown as sort of red and blue here. It bends over and then they do a PCR. The two straighten up, they bend over again, they do another PCR, now you've got four. They do enough cycles of this to get something like 10 to 100,000 uh, fragments in what they call a cluster. Ideally, the clusters end up looking like this, perfectly separated from each other. But the Illumina way of doing things is to use brute force. So when the clusters are not perfectly separated from each other, their, their optics, the informatics they use to analyze the images, finds those clusters that are not sufficiently well separated and throws them away. Focuses on just the clusters that are sufficiently well separated. Um, as the resolution and the image processing software has improved, they've been able to use more and more of the clusters at tighter and tighter densities and still resolve them adequately well. Again, adequately has to do with the way their software works, and it's not really an open algorithm. But right now, they're able to get about 400,000, no, 400 million individual clusters from one flow cell. That's a lot. 400 million seems like a lot, particularly when you think about the whole size of the human genome times 100 bases. Um, they're very productive. 400 million is a lot more also than the 454 system can produce in one shot, which is one of the reasons they're going out of the business. The next thing that was innovative about the Illumina system is they decided to put a terminator on the end of every nucleotide. So you could only add one at a time. So instead of just flowing deoxy A, all over the flow cell, they would essentially flow dideoxy A. It was a special nucleotide that had a fluorescent 
um, um, a fluorescent group attached, but also what they call a reversible terminator. So nothing more could be added. So when you flow an A like that over the whole flow cell, every cloned fragment that has an A at the next position, say following the sequencing primer, will receive an A and emit a fluorescence and be detected. Then they would flow a T, and every open T position would get a T, then a C, then a G. So after the four nucleotides have been flowed, every single one of the clusters should have advanced by one. Then they put a reagent that removes the terminators from all of them. Then another series of four nucleotides would flow and light up. And if things are working well, each cluster only lights up one time for when the four nucleotides are flowed. There's just one base that follows next. As a result, when they do 100 cycles, 100 sets of four nucleotides flowed over, all of the different clusters give you sequence reads of 100. So all the, in the data file produced by Illumina, all the reads are the same length. <clears throat> That's an advantage. Also, because of the terminators, there's no homopolymer effect. You only ever get the addition of exactly one base for each cycle. Their only real quality issue is correctly detecting the base and dealing with this problem of overlapping clusters and, and properly resolving them and not being too greedy, throwing away any questionable data because they have so much data. Getting rid of a little data in order to preserve the quality of the rest is the overall philosophy of Illumina sequencing. Okay, so there's three basic methods of building sequence libraries. This is true for all the next-gen technologies, but we're going to focus on how Illumina does it. I've been describing the shotgun method, where you take a genome, or basically any source of DNA, you chop it up into fragments of approximately the size that you want. That could be by sonication. There's some other clever chopping methods that are out there on the market, mostly trademarked by different companies. Um, you attach the adapters or linkers onto the ends of your fragments. You size select because your chopping is imprecise. Some pieces will be too small, some will be too large. So you go through some step, gel purification or whatever, to select exactly the size that you want for your library. And there's some constraints on the Illumina system, and then there's also constraints of yield and whatnot, and just the, the design of your experiment, what size fragments you want. But fragments that are in the range between 300 and 500 bases are used most commonly now. A couple years back, it was mostly 200 base fragments that were used. Pieces that are too long won't make those nice small clusters. Pieces that are too short won't kneel properly, won't have the right um, kinetics to, uh, to work well in the system. Another way of making a library is to use some sort of PCR. So instead of sequencing everything, you focus on just those regions that you want. The PCR could be sort of complicated. You could have a bunch of primers all at once. You could pool primers from lots of different samples and sequence essentially the same region from many different sources, many different individuals or whatever. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then there's a, another method called selection where you could use something like a microarray or a bunch of primers that have complementary sequences to the sequence that you want. The most popular of the fragment capture methods is called exome sequencing, where uh, individual capture oligos are designed for every exon in the genome. So you're talking several hundred thousand different capture probes. DNA synthesis techniques are sufficient to do that now in the same way that we can synthesize millions of oligos on a, mic on a 
AFI microarray, you can sequence millions of oligos on an array or in solution to capture the fragments that you want. Given that you've got your oligos, you also stick onto the oligos something that allows you to recover them. Generally, it's biotin. So you add some biotinylated nucleotides at the end. Then you mix your chopped up genome with the capture probes. Select out the capture probes, avidin, magnetic beads, something like that. Wash away all the rest of the genome that's not been captured. Then attach your primers, put it into the uh, sequencing system. The key advantage of doing an exome-based approach is that you've enriched for coding sequences, which is about 2% of the genome or a little less, 1% of the genome. And so, you know, your data is much richer. Also, you can focus on coding sequences only. Um, also, the cost, it's going to cost you 100-fold less. So, in theory, you could do, you know, 100 patients for the cost of one or get deeper coverage to more accurately call mutations. So exome sequencing has become very popular. It's probably the most popular form of genome sequencing right now. Um, the thousand genomes and the cancer genome atlas mostly have exome-based sequencing data files. OK, I'm going to also talk about barcodes and multiplexing. I mentioned mixing together a bunch of samples. If you do that, how do you tell them apart? The simple way to do it is to use different adapter molecules for each sample that already have a coded sequence built into them. You know, since you're going to be going through oligosynthesis, you don't just synthesize one set of adapters and ligate them on to all, your, all the different samples that you have. You have a bunch of different adapter sequences that differ by a short barcode sequence. And I should have spent more time on the informatics of this because it's interesting, but the barcodes run from like 8 to 11 bases. And what you really want is to have no two barcodes that can be changed from one to the other by a single mutation. They all have to differ by at least two bases of mutation. It's, and, and, and this general, this comes from information theory, basically, where, you know, when you're trying to extract a signal through garbled communication lines, you know, you want each of your bits of information to have at least some error checking built into it so that you don't mistake one bit for another, one letter for another in a teletype communication or whatever. And so these things are called Golay encoded barcodes. And sets of these have been published with up to 2,000 different um, 11 base sequences, none of which overlap each other by you know, less than two base differences. So we can sequence thousands of samples all at once on the same flow cell. This is particularly important for these PCR-based approaches because you're getting a relatively small amount of sequence information from each sample. And 400 million reads is a lot of overkill if you're just reading you know, a, few thou a few hundred bases from one sample. So if you have lots of samples and you can mix them together in one, re in one lane, um, you get more efficient use of the sequencing acreage or real estate. It's also possible to put indexes on both primers. You don't need just one index. So now you've got 11 bases here and 11 bases there. So, you know, in theory, you could have 2,000 squared different mixtures. Or what's more frequently done is that the two different primers are used to confirm each other that yes, we have primer one, and yes, we have barcode two, both of which indicate that this is sample you know, 826. So that helps you resolve some of the ambiguities. So you can do some mix of both. 
Um, another variation on the technology that's become really important lately is called paired end sequencing. In this case, I've talked about chopping a fragment, attaching adapters, the adapters anneal to the surface of the uh, flow cell. After a bunch of chemistry, you read out the bases one by one. After that whole thing is done, they have developed an additional set of reactions that basically trims off the original copy and retains the new copy, <laughs> bends it over, makes a new PCR, creates a new version of the sequence, and then sequences it again from the opposite end. So you get one sequence that's 3 prime to 5 prime, and then one sequence that's on the complementary strand. You know, they both read 5 prime to 3 prime, but one sequence on the plus strand, essentially one sequence coming back on the minus strand. This is really, really useful in a lot of different situations. Um, very simply, there's plenty of repeated sequences in the genome, human genome, any genome, even bacteria, which if your reads are fairly short, like 100 bases, there are ambigu ambiguities. This 100 bases could go here, or it could go there, or it could go somewhere else. There's a bunch of different places in the genome that have that same 100 base sequence. But if you've read both ends of a larger fragment, say a 500 or a 1,000 base fragment, both ends, then we have the situation down here where if one end has an ambiguous map, but the other end has a clean map that's in sequence that's unique, now you know the position for both ends. And this helps you not just sequence around the repeat, but get a very accurate collection of overlapping reads for the repeat itself. And repeats tend to vary a little bit. They have a base that's different here and there. And previously, we weren't able to use that information very effectively at all, unless you had you know, a 600 base Sanger read that had that repeat in the middle of it. So now, with the paired end sequencing, we can make reasonable approach to this as long as the repeat region is smaller than the whole fragment with both ends. For really large segmental duplications, this approach is not that helpful. It's that, it, it, there's a lot of considerations there, but if you had the choice, 50 base paired end is going to give you more information than 100 base single end. 100 base paired end is not going to give you a whole lot more RNA-seq information than 50 base paired end. On the other hand, if you're doing mutation discovery or de novo sequencing, which are coming up, then what you really want is the maximum overall coverage. And, there, and it turns out that because running the machine a little longer s saves you on the sample prep end of things, that you get more basis per dollar doing paired end, as well as the advantage of the spacing. And when you're doing de novo genomes, you know, some brand new genome where there's no reference, the paired end is exceptionally valuable in trying to build these overlap maps of how the fragments stitch together to form a whole genome. So you would always do paired end. So for RNA-seq, the paired end has value. The longer reads, not so much. For others, you know, some, but like above 50, it's not going to help you that much because what you really want from each RNA-seq read is a measure of count, right? There's a molecule here. The, this RNA was present one time in my, in my sample. So 100 bases doesn't give you a different count than 50. And 100 bases doesn't align a whole lot better than 50. If you do the math, you're adding maybe 5% or less, maybe 
of additional unique genome sites. Going from like 25 to 50, you're adding a tremendous amount of uniqueness. Going from 50 to 100, only a little. It, it kind of plateaus. But adding the other 50, 300 or 500 bases downstream adds tremendous value. There's other things that it helps you with also, like defining alternative splice sites. There's a little bit of value in longer reads if alternative splicing is interesting because sometimes the read will span the splice site. So it, it, it really kind of depends on your objectives. So I got a whole lecture on RNA-seq and we'll get to that. But I wanted just you to know what paired end is. So when I mention it, you can reference back to this slide. Okay, summary of some key points that it's good to keep in mind when you're thinking about Illumina technology. Obviously, it's massively parallel. Everything gets done at once. You make one sequencing library, you load a flow cell, you get back a data file. You can later split that data file by barcode into individual sequence files for each sample. We'll talk about that informatically. Um, the amplification step, that cluster building, is strictly a signal amplification step. And it doesn't generally create much data biasing. It reads one base at a time from all the fragments, so all your reads are the same length. Um, okay, the paired ends come from the same cloned molecule. That's really important. Um, it allows you to get a little bit of information um, about whether, you know, given mutations are on the same chromosome, the same strand, versus coming from different um, homologous chromosomes. There's a bunch of information, or really key if you're doing like a metagenomics, right, where you have two, have a PCR fragment and you read one end and the other end, knowing that they come from the same molecule means that they come from the same bacteria, and therefore you can join those two and, and do a more accurate phylogenetics. Um, important in the Illumina system, the barcodes have their own primer and their own completely separate set of sequencing reactions. It's good in the sense that you don't lose any sequence data. If you want to add a 8 or 11 base barcode, you just tell the sequencer to collect that much additional information and it's stored in a separate data file. It's only used to split the original data file into subsections for each sample. So typically when you get your sequence back for your sample, it no longer has the barcode. Although, actually, it's in the header. It tells you what barcode this sample was split into, what barcoded section. Um, weirdly, though, if there's a glitch in the sequencing machi machine when you're reading the barcode from the barcode primer, then essentially all your data is lost because you can't tell which sample this sequence came from and therefore it's most likely useless. So it's good to keep them separate, but then all your eggs are kind of in that one basket that those eight or 11 cycles of sequencing have to be good. And yes. Yeah, there you go. But it's still annoying. <laughs> Um, so, so the limitations on the technology, like what are the constraints and what can they push against? Obviously, it's the optics. They're resolving a solid plate surface into little tiny grid squares, pixels basically. And so by increasing the sensitivity and the resolution of the optics, they could maybe reduce the number of PCR cycles, make the clusters smaller, and squeeze more clones onto the same uh, surface. Um, also, the image processing, it can improve so that they can further resolve partially overlapping clusters in some clever method. Um, they could make the flow cell bigger. 
so that you could just wash more molecules onto the machine and they would just process bigger images with the same basic amount of chemistry. Um, and then there's this issue of the fidelity of the reagents, which I haven't talked about yet, but a lot of things have to work very well in order to get good quality sequence data. Obviously, when you flow a particular letter, it has to add at every complementary position in every clone. So the, the plumbing has to work, right? The microfluidics have to get that a to the whole surface of the flow cell. Chemically, the previous um, blocker has to be removed so that it physically adds to the position where it's complementary everywhere. Um, then the block on that one has to be good so that if there are two A's in a row, you don't accidentally add two. And then once you've added all four letters and you use the reagent that removes all the blocks that allows the next um, round of next cycle of bases to be added, that removal step has to be perfect. So what tends to happen over hundreds of cycles is that individual molecules in the cluster start to fall out. One just stops producing data, right? It, it doesn't unblock and you can't get any more bases on there. So that just reduces the signal strength over time. So the intensity drops off. You'll definitely see that. Another thing that could happen is it could block, but then get unblocked in the next round. So it fails to unblock, but then the next one or the one after that finally knocks loose the, the blocking reagent. So that one molecule is now out of sync with the rest. And so now this cluster is sometimes, you know, for most of the molecules is adding an A, but for the few that had this happen is adding a T. So they get out of sync. And that makes the, the base calls less precise. So those are the major issues of fidelity. And those are places where Illumina has made progress on all of these limitations, which is why every six months or so, they double the output of their machines because you know, the various teams are working on all of these problems and, you know, they iteratively make progress on all of them. And we don't seem to have reached the theoretical limits of what can be done with optics, miniaturization, sensitivity, fidelity of the reagents, etc. I mean, I don't know what the theoretical limits might be. Also, unlike in microarray, where there was a falling off of utility, I mean, you don't need more than 10 million array bits, or at least no one was really asking for it. Everyone's asking for more data cheaper. I mean, there's still more experiments that people would do if they cost half as much, or a tenth as much, or one one hundredth as much. And Illumina sees that as they're as it gets cheaper, people will do more, and they'll end up with more money, not less, remarkably. I mean, if cars got cheaper every year, that wouldn't be good for the manufacturer. But when sequencing gets cheaper, Illumina seems to benefit. So what do we have right now? The machine right now that we're using for main production is a high seq 2500, um, I guess 1.5 billion reads per sample, something like that. You, we mostly do 2 by 100, but I think it can do 2 by 150. For RNA-seq and chip-seq, we sometimes do 50 base reads. Um, the only challenge is you need to run the whole machine for that many reads. So the whole flow cell needs to be set up that way. If you set it up with multiple lanes, then you've got to have all the everybody who's using a lane has to want the same set setup. Um, the other vendors, um, there were several, um, including 454 and something called Solid from Life Technologies, have fallen behind. There is one up and coming other company called Ion Torrent, and I haven't talked about their technology because it isn't so significantly different except that they use a lot less reagents. So potentially, it could be cheaper. 
but up to this point they haven't shown that they can produce quantity of data and quality of data at the same cost point that Illumina can produce it right now. So probably 80, even 90% of all the sequence data that's being produced globally is being produced on Illumina machines. But other companies are constantly chasing because it's a big sort of ripe, juicy market. And there are potentially specialty markets like very long reads. There's a company called PacBio that can produce 10,000 base reads, but only 80% accurate. So that's kind of a pain in the butt. I mean, every fifth base is wrong. So that takes a lot, and, and they're relatively expensive. So it's a, it's a niche market. If they improve their accuracy, they might compete. Oxford Nanopore claims to be able to produce a million base reads but they haven't sold any machines yet. Okay, we're gonna talk about quality for a couple minutes. Illumina produces some runtime metrics. You can monitor the machine, and this is the kind of stuff that you see. It breaks down the flow cell into sort of a physical grid, and it just sort of shows you whether things are working well on all the different little squares of the flow cell. I won't get into it too much, but they're, they're actually doing some real-time processing. They have a, a spike in. There's a small amount of a known DNA sequence mixed in all over the flow cell called PhiX. And so they're constantly checking the reads of, against PhiX and seeing how good the match is. And that gives them an error, prob an error estimate among other things. And then there's just some general measurements of the optics, how well, how many clusters they see, how well resolved they are, what's the average intensity of all of the fluorescent signals across each of the subtiles of the flow cell. So this is the kind of stuff that's being summarized in this graph. Since I'm not training you as machine operators, I'm not going to break it down a lot further. Um, I'm going to show you some output data, but I just want to focus on, obviously, when we're producing data of this sort, we need to have standardized file formats. There's been a lot of wandering over the past 10 years uh, as to what the file format should be. Um, when 454 first came out with the very first high-throughput sequencer, they declared that everyone in the world will have to read SFF file format because that's what they felt like writing. They made it up completely on their own and had no reference to any publication or any other data standard. It was just a binary format that you could only read with their software and out of that binary file, you could extract base pairs, you could extract quality calls in a different file, but they claimed that you had to archive the whole SFF file as the experimental product of their machine. Later on, when Illumina came along, they had about six or 12 different file formats that various sub 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 versions of their software would produce so you know if you were a bioinformatician and you would write a script that would process data in a particular file format then two weeks later there'd be a 0.1.1 version of the software where the file format was now different and just your it wasn't minorly different it was completely different so your whole script had to be completely trashed and you had to start from scratch um, at the moment, we have, folk, we have congealed on a file format that's called FastQ that makes some sense. It, it sounds a lot like FastA because it is a lot like FastA. In fact, it's FastA plus quality. So what you get in a FastQ file is four lines for each read, a read being one cluster read in one direction. Um, you have a header line, typically starts with an at symbol, but don't write software to look for it. I'll explain later. 
Um, it has a string that represents the name of the machine, the code on the flow cell that you've used, and then a grid location for where this particular read is on that flow cell. And then it says length 152, which is kind of redundant because all 400 million reads are going to have the exact same length. So they're really not concerned about saving bits in your data file. Then it has the actual sequence, which is really the information you're after. Um, if you see an N, that's a base that can't be called. Its quality is less than 50%. You know, we, we can't determine what base it is. And then it has all these other letters. And then it has a repeat of the same exact quality line, except this one starts with a plus symbol. Again, don't count on that. It may change next week. Um, then there's this really weird string of all kinds of different mishmashy letters. That is an ASCII string. And I'll explain in the next slide why they use ASCII to encode the quality. But that is a quality score that ranges somewhere from zero up to a max of about 40, according to their algorithms. And the reason why they use an ASCII letter is because there's no other way to get a number from zero to 40 to take up just one character. Even alphabet doesn't co compress down enough. So instead of using some arbitrary alphanumeric setup, they defaulted to ASCII, which at least everyone knows how to encode and decode in a library that's in every type of software in existence. So after four lines, then you get the next read, which has a slightly different header. Yes? So it's they can produce a FASTQ file. It's not the same in the sense that their quality strings are different. But they do, you can get a FASTQ from iontorrent. They have their own internal format as well, which their own software works on. But they don't want to be completely noncompliant. And FASTQ is the format that the NCBI read archive now requires. That has, be, it has become the default raw product of a sequencing experiment is a FASTQ file. Okay, about those quality scores. It's based on a um, piece, an older piece of software called FRED, which is uh, Phil Green's read description software. It was part of the FRED FRAP package that was written for early Sanger sequencing back around 1980. Um, it's a very logical way of encoding error probability. The quality is simply the log of the error probability. How likely is this base to be an error? It's minus 10 times the log ten, base 10 of the error probability. So that a, a quality score of 30 represents a chance of error 1 in 1,000. And a quality score of 20, chance of error 1 in 100. Um, Obviously, a quality score worse than 0.5, chance of error of 50%, is a useless base, and that base will come up as an N. There's a range of opinion about what you should do with a quality score that's, say, 0.1. You know, you have a 10% chance this base is wrong. There's a 90% chance that base is right. So should you keep that data? How should you deal with it? The, every different piece of software that reads FASTQ files handles those quality strings in a different way, which is why you can get different alignments. You can get different variant calls depending on what software you use, different assemblies, all those things. That's one of the reasons why FASTQ is such a resilient format to use as an archive because everyone can come back and choose to use the data in the way they see fit for their algorithm. If you compress down further, then you lose some of that ability to process the data as you see fit. Um, how do they get the error probabilities that go into this formula? How do you get P? Turns out to be completely arbitrary. Aluminum makes it up as they go along, and they change it with 
each iteration of the software, each new kit, each tweak to the reagents. They say that it's composed of uh, issues of software, chemistry, hardware. Oh, actually, intensity of the clusters, obviously, signal to noise ratio, which is usually defined as how much brighter is the given base compared to either all the others or the brightness of the next brightest one. But that's just one piece of data that they feed into this algorithm. And then they say they calibrate that score after using the data based on doing some reads of known sequence, aligning them to the reference, and seeing what sort of score their software gave versus how frequently a base of that score was accurate or inaccurate. Since that changes with every tweak of the imaging, of the chemistry, of the flow cell, it's a completely arbitrary number and can't be compared between any two different um, re runs. So when you say Q30, it's basically Illumina thinks this base is a Q30. You can't reference it to any absolute. And it's calibrated on their machine, at the temperature in their lab, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Once they get a Q score from their formula, they convert it to the Q scale that we just talked about. Um, an important thing to think about is that in the FASTQ file, every letter of sequence data, which is what you really want, is a two-bit piece of information, right? It's one of four bases, or I guess it could be an N, so you could think of it as, you know, N would be a, a third bit. Whereas the quality score is an ASCII character, which is stored in eight bits. So when you try and gzip, compress up your FASTQ files, it's actually the quality scores that take up more room. If you could reduce down the amount of information in each of those quality score letters or somehow compress that data horizontally as well as vertically, you know, adjacent quality scores are correlated, um, we could do a lot better. And I won't talk about that more, but data storage for sequencing data is a problem. And FASTQ is a big part of that problem. Eventually, we'll figure out something better. OK, so this is a typical visualization of the quality scores. What we're, what we're visualizing here is across the reads from the read. On average, all of the reads at base 1, base 2, base 3, this one's only 36 bases long. Obviously, it's kind of an older version of Illumina. Um, we're getting 100 and 150s now. But it's the same thing. We generally think of quality scores better than 30 as being good. In this graph, better than 28 is shown in the green zone. These are box and whisker plots. So I think the, the red is either the mean or the median. Um, they don't vary so much, but the low end varies quite a bit. And as you get towards the end of the read, some of the reads drop down in quality. So the, the whisker at the low end drops lower and lower. So it might be worthwhile to apply some sort of filtering algorithm to throw away the worst quality reads or trim off the worst quality bases from the worst quality reads, particularly if what you want to do with your sequencing data is look for mutations. So we almost always do a visualization like this for every single sample that comes off of the sequencer. OK, a little on applications. We talked about finding mutations. Yeah. Well, in Illumina, all the reads should be the same length. Right, but at the same time, at that same length, like, you know, if you say, like, the last few bases are low quality. Yeah. 
depends what you want to do. If you're doing RNA-seq and you just want to count molecules, then 50 bases is plenty. In fact, 30 is enough. That's what the, that's the seed size for the alignment algorithm. If it lands that 30 and then extends a little, you know that you have a good alignment. If you're doing something else, like trying to build a genome, then trimming away the low quality is very important. Illumina doesn't. They give you the FASTQ file with 172 bases or whatever. You can run post-processing methods on that data if you want to. They also have something which I didn't talk about, which is a um, basic sort of quality threshold, which comes from the imaging. It's called pass filter. And they mark any read as not passing the quality filter early on. And those don't really bear looking at because they they're, they're have low intensity or there are two overlapping clusters that can't be resolved. So they, they fail the very basic quality parameters that happen during image processing, signal translation. So there's no point in even looking at those bases because they're all just jumbled. So you typically ignore, again, they put them all in the FASTQ file, but you typically ignore those that have a that have failed the fast Q filter. And you definitely have the option of generating a fast Q file that doesn't have any failed reads in it. But people decided they wanted them, so Illumina puts them in by default. OK. I'm going to yeah go really fast. We've been talking about finding mutations, which is obviously a very important aspect of next-gen sequencing. It applies to cancer. It applies to um, genetic defects. It has potential applications to a lot of other diseases, but not yet realized. Um, epidemiology, forensics, metagenomic sequencing populations of bacteria, lots and lots of applications, more than I have time to talk about. Here's a really nice picture that I'll share with you that people have come up with. The thing that's most striking to me is that new applications and new sort of sub-applications get added onto this map constantly. So people are finding new things to do with sequencing data, new ways of interrogating genomes. Um, there's a whole technology that sprouted up about mapping three-dimensional interactions between different DNA molecules or bent DNA molecules, which is kind of a subset of epigenetics in a sense. And it's also a subset of the ChIP-seq technique in a sense. But people can come, up at, com, come at that from different directions. So this is a very dynamic sort of a map. As the cost gets lower, these innovations are spurred on. You know, it, it's not so valuable to think of a brand new application that's going to cost a million dollars because people aren't going to be able to use it. But if you can come up with a brand new application and the sequencing part of your application costs a thousand or five thousand dollars, then you know it, it's potentially broadly useful. Um, more samples obviously gives you more power from a statistical point of view, lets you find smaller effects or more robust proof of your effects being real, more replicates. But also it brings up the fact that the bar gets lower, right? If the sequencing costs 50,000 bucks, then the rich labs are going to do it. If it costs 5,000 bucks, then the poorer labs are going to do it. If it costs 25 bucks, then high school students can do it, right? But if I'm telling you that the cost is going down by half every six months, the $25 sequencing run is, is going to happen. Someone's going to be producing a kit where you can send in your DNA and get back your sequence cheap. Um, as more people get into the game, 
more of those new people coming in at the lower level don't have dedicated bioinformaticians in the lab, don't have access to a core computing facility, don't have a full-time biostatistician to consult with them, and therefore their level of informatics skill is lower. They need more help or they need tools that don't require as much skill or they need to take a lot of online courses. The sequencing gets cheaper and better. The bottleneck is the bioinformatics. We can produce data in a lot of studies, ENCODE, TCGA, et cetera, way faster than we can produce good analytical results. So these data sets are sitting out there awaiting people with cleverness and compute power to ask interesting questions. Even just in routine work, you know, I just want to look at a gene expression change due to hypoxia in my yeast cells. The lab that thinks of that experiment and has the 5,000 bucks to pay for the sequencing has to pay 20,000 bucks for a bioinformatician to do the analysis for them. I just signed a grant proposal like that yesterday. <laughs> so you're going to actually spend more time on data analysis than on building your library and doing the sequencing. That's just a fact of life right now. Um, the standards change. It's not a trivial thing where you can just take a tutorial and go ahead and process your data. The file formats are changing. The sort of wisdom of the current standard procedure keeps changing. New software comes along that does a better job according to some benchmark. And then you have to read that benchmark paper and decide whether you believe it or not, or whether you want to go with a different benchmark paper that came to a completely different conclusion about the best way to say, measure gene expression using RNA-seq, or the best way to find the peaks in a ChIP-seq file. So you know, different statisticians have different opinions. So it's a, it's a challenging environment where universal data processing standards have not really been uh, established. Very rapid release of methods, software goes through very rapid update cycles, and then the data itself is large, which means doing the processing can be sort of laborious in terms of data download, finding enough CPU power to churn through. So you may not be able to do lots of experimental iterations of your analysis with lots of different settings on all the parameters. General data analysis pipeline, the images that are done fluorescently, black box by the vendor, intensity files, you know, the brightness of each spot at each cycle, black box software by the vendor. Eventually, it spits out the reads. Now we're talking about FASTQ format. That's pretty much where the vendor hands off to you. In the case of Illumina, they have some additional tools to do some of the other analyses, but in that case, it's not clear that you have to do it their way. There are many competing methods, and theirs are only one, and they're not necessarily proven to be the best. For example, alignment, which is a whole lecture I'm going to do next week, or maybe Thursday. Um, okay. Another important point I'm just going to touch on briefly is it gets costly to store this data. Um, the yellow line, no, the blue line is how rapidly a hard disk doubles. In other words, you go to Staples, you buy the top of the line hard disk for 200 bucks. You go back a year later, the same 200 bucks buys a slightly bigger hard disk, right? That doubling time is much slower than what a thousand bucks worth of sequencing will get you from the core facility. So every year you spend 10,000 bucks on sequencing, you have to spend an increasingly large amount on hard disk to store your sequencing data. Eventually, the cost of the hard disk becomes prohibitive compared to the cost of the sequencing. We just dropped a million and a half bucks on hard disk last week to store the output from the sequencing core. And it's not enough. It'll only give us six to eight months worth of storage space. <laughs>
So now we have to tell people that we're not going to store your data, we're going to throw it away. You have to buy the hard disk when you do the sequencing. So now you have to budget hard disk space in your own lab to store 100 gigs for every sequence file. So we have this thing. I'm not going to show you how it works, but this is what I mean when I talk about the cluster. It's a complicated data storage system that moves data from the high seq into an array of disks. And it puts the compute power right next to the disk. So you don't have to move those gigabytes of data very far physically in order to run the computing algorithms. So that's really important is to put your CPU power close to your data. It's a huge problem with the public projects like ENCODE and TCGA is they don't have CPU power available. They're happy to let you download as many terabytes of data as you feel like, provided you've cleared the whatever HIPAA requirements, but they won't let you log on and do your compute over there. You have to bring the data here, which means you have to store it and you have to have the compute power here. So we have invested in heavy compute power. The storage is actually more of a problem. All right, I'm not going to talk too much about alignment because I'm going to spend a whole lecture on it. Um, but obviously, just having the reads is not very helpful. You need to know to map them onto a genome and then look for variants or look for the coverage. How many reads map to a given position, which could tell you something about gene expression. It could tell you something about protein DNA interactions. It could tell you something about copy number. Depends on how you structure your assay. I'll, I will say this, that the alignment has taken a step up. Now that we're generating hundreds of millions of reads in one data file, BLAST is not nearly fast enough. BLAST is good for thousands of sequences in minutes to hours, not millions, not hundreds of millions. We want BLAST is too sensitive. BLAST can match uh, a sequence between a mouse and a human or even between a human and a plant. We want something that matches a human sequence right back to that same human, give or take a couple of mutations, right? So we want sequence accuracy that's in the range of about 95%. One or two mutations, say, every 50 bases. Maybe one or two in 25 bases, certainly no more than that. So I'm going to talk about algorithms that give away sensitivity in exchange for speed. And also, they use a lot of RAM. Um, we also have to deal with uh, mapping problems. This, we talked about this before. When there's repeats, the same 25 mer can map to multiple locations. How does your alignment algorithm handle that? Does it give you all the matches? Does it choose one match randomly, et cetera? OK, I said this already. After alignment, we have a new file format. It's called SAM, Sequence Alignment Map. It looks a lot like FASTQ, except that this uh, first line has this real, oops, this key bit here, which says chromosome 13 at this position. So it, it tells you the start of where this read maps to. And then there's a string over here, 76M equals. This is a string that tells you if there's any mismatches. So you have 76 matches in a row. That's what this thing is telling you. It's a, called a cigar string. And then there's uh, the sequence. There's the variance. And then there's this additional string that I'm not going to parse right now. But it gives you a whole lot of other information about the alignment. Alignment quality string, basically. And parsing this string is the job of software called SAM tools read SAM files. And I'll try and introduce that and get you familiar with it in the next couple weeks. So why so much data? We know the human genome is 3 billion, 3.2 billion bases. That's not such a big 
file, right? You've got flash drives that big. Three gigabytes is not killer. But we don't sequence the genome just one off. When we sequence the genome, we're first of all, we're randomly chopping it. Then we're ligating things on. We're doing a little PCR. We're attaching it to a solid surface. We're doing some more PCR. We're flowing reagents. At best, it's a Poisson distribution. Hey, statistics comes up. Right? We're randomly sampling, which means there's going to be peaks and valleys in the places that we sample. If you sampled equivalent to 1x, then you'd only get good coverage of a very small part of the genome, and you'd miss lots of it. 5x, not nearly good enough. Plenty of places will still have zero coverage. In general, looking at the statistics saying, if we needed a, realistically a minimum of 5x coverage in order to see whether a mutation is present or not, because the sequencing itself has an error rate somewhere around 1%. So we certainly can't take a genome that has 1% error, one mutation every 100 bases. That would be horrible. Five reads on top of each other, each with 1% error rate give you a consensus that's in the range that we can live with. Less than 1 in 10,000 errors gets through that um, level. How do you get a minimum of 5x coverage? Well, you have to have a whole genome coverage of 30-fold. Even there, there are regions that have, have a bias. And those are consistent biases. They have to do with nucleotide composition, three-dimensional structure of the genome, proteins that are attached to it that make certain regions harder to sequence than others. Consistently low coverage. There's also problems with alignment. Those, those alignment software creates artifacts. Uh, insertion in the genome compared to the reference will create mismatches all around it. Lots of other issues like that. Sequence specific issues that show up basically as bugs in the alignment software. Not every sequence aligns with exactly the same accuracy given sort of a random or non-random error profile and a non-random collection of bases. So anyway, we have lots of data. Plus, I told you the quality strings don't compress. So 100 gigs of 100 gigabases is at least two or maybe 300 gigabytes of data for one act, for a one person genome sequence sufficiently accurate to call mutations. That's why we need so much data. All right, I don't have the time to talk about ChIPSeq because I want to talk about R. So ChIPSeq is next, the next lecture. And I'm also going to table RNA-seq for next week's lecture. And de novo assembly in the end of next week. All right, things I really wanted to emphasize. Illumina sequencing, shotgun, amplicon, and, and selected fragments. How the quality scores work. Some intro to some data formats. I'm going to show you some more next week. Barcodes and multiplex, read alignment, data storage, and some of the applications. Right, so ChIPSeq and alignment next time. Okay.